Hi everyone, Jeff Keefe at Wheatstone. I'm here today to talk to you about the X5, our top of the line FM and HD processor. We've added some new features to it, which I, I thought we should uh, probably tell you about. And uh, the first thing is we've got a brand new uh, AGC front end, uh, which now feeds the uh, multiband limiter and the limitless clipper, which is, uh, we introduced that about a year ago. And the, uh, the signal path basically is processing for both FM and HD. We have an insert point right after the front end, uh, and the insert return then feeds the FM back end and the HD limiter. And what the insert point is good for is uh, adding effects like reverb, uh, external watermark encoders like for Nielsen. Uh, in fact, there's a new feature I'm gonna circle back to here in a little bit. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it's got everything you're probably going to need for, for FM and an HD. One of the things about the insert point is it's, it's after the HDC and after the first set of limiters. So whatever is being fed by the insert point is getting a very steady diet of levels. That's especially important if you're feeding, for instance, a watermark encoder. One of the other features of the X5 is we've got a built-in FM HD tuner. Uh, we license that uh, from Ubiquity, and what that allows us to do is to do automatic, real-time HD time alignment. Uh, within, with this in the circuit, uh, the, your time cannot be off uh, by more than one sample, and uh, it keeps a log to let you know if the time has drifted for some reason outside of the bounds of the correction. Uh, we're able to basically synchronize uh, within about a second and a half of, uh, of error. Uh, so if your error is within that window, we can grab it and slowly move it in. Uh, there's several different correction speeds that are available. Uh, in case you wanted to tailor it, uh, we recommend the slowest speed, which is uh, more compatible with uh, watermark encoders. The jump in samples uh, doesn't upset the ability of the people meters to read the watermark. Uh, the, one of the other features the X5 has that a lot of people like, we have full-time logging. And what I mean by that is the processor is logging everything that happens to it, whether it's a loss of an input channel or it's a, a preset take, whether it's done by the scheduler or done manually. Uh, it knows when someone has connected remotely from a GUI uh, and tells you what IP address it's connected from. Uh, if there's a, a schedule change uh, that's changing some features of the RDS, uh, or just presets, it lets you know about that. And one of the things about the, uh, the scheduler, and I mentioned the RDS, the X5 does have a full featured RDS system built in. Uh, it basically lets you run either a static uh, RDS if you don't have uh, information coming from say a, an, an automation system, uh, and you will just want to run it static with uh, uh, station ID and maybe slogan, uh, you can do that. We also have the ability to support up to 32 what we call data sets. And data sets are basically RDS encoder configurations. And they can be recalled with presets. They can be loaded manually. Um, you could do uh, a time of day change when, say, the morning show is over, maybe at 10 o'clock or whatever you want to go and, and transmit something else, uh, some other pattern of information on the RDS. The data sets allow you to recall that pattern and place it on the air and leave it there until you want to change it. We have full support for USEP uh, automation. USEP is uh, one of the standards now that's used by most automation systems. They can communicate with the X5 over a connected network and update song and artist and weather and all kinds of things you might want to have coming from the automation system. I mentioned earlier we had uh, uh, insert point, which can accommodate the external Nielsen watermarking encoder. And I wanted to mention that the X5 is now equipped with a built-in Nielsen watermarking encoder, and it's controlled by a separate web page. Uh, it's got its own management, which keeps it separate from the processor. And uh, you have uh, all the normal options you would have with the hardware encoder as far as you know, whether the watermarking is enabled or disabled or the encoder is bypassed, uh, whether the encoder is running outside of the United States, uh, what kind of behavior you want it to, uh, to have if it sees a pre-existing watermark from, say, an outside program source. 
Um, and also in the U.S., we have a, a requirement that the encoder basically do what does what they call step aside. If it sees um, uh, EAS data uh, coming over the air uh, from the studio or wherever the uh, EAS encoder is, it will stop the watermark during those, uh, those data tones to keep from uh, corrupting it. The uh, watermark uh, encoder can be set up to either grab a dynamic address from your hosted network or can be set up to grab a static address. Uh, most people prefer static. Uh, that way the encoder is always where you know where it is. It's got its IP address and, and you've got it nailed down. The um, watermark encoder also can stay synchronized and it's really important with the Nielsen watermarking that the timestamps on the watermark itself agree very closely with actual real time in UTC. So we have an NTP server in the uh, encoder that allows you to let it grab time from an off-site network or your own hosted NTP server to make sure that the data watermarking that's occurring for your station, uh, the timestamps are close and those watermarks are then counted as valid uh, by the rating company when they get the downloaded meter, uh, people meter data. One of the other features of the built-in Nielsen watermarking encoder is uh, comprehensive logging. You know, we built a, a, a pretty solid log function into the X5. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it shows you all the things that the hardware itself knows has happened to it. Uh, audio failures and preset changes and GUI logs in and all that. For the Nielsen watermarking encoder, we, we kind of went along the same path. We wanted to give the end user as much comprehensive information about the encoder as we could. Uh, it's very handy because when you have a question and you call up N Nielsen Tech Support, they're going to ask you things like, what firmware version are you running? And, and what's the, uh, what are your CBET codes? And wanna, they want to double check that with you. All that information is in the log. And uh, you can uh, download the logs if you want uh, remotely and send them to Nielsen, or you can uh, print them out or just save them off of the hardware if you like. Um, there's no limit to the number of logs. Uh, we've got tons and tons of storage on the encoder. There's, we calculate there's about 15 years worth of logging space uh, on the little drive that we have on the encoder. So. Uh, you don't have to worry about running out of log space. Uh, there's plenty of space there. So uh, that pretty much wraps it up for the X5 and the new feature, the built-in Nielsen watermarking. Uh, we're in uh, field trials right now. Uh, that'll go on for another 35 to 60 days or so. And that gives uh, Nielsen a chance to basically compare uh, their hardware encoder with the new uh, software encoders in our processor. That about wraps it up. I think if you take a really good look at the X5, you're going to be surprised at what's actually in there, what the capabilities are. And uh, for the rest of this, I'm going to turn it over to Wildman Jay Tyler. Hello, I'm Jay Tyler, the Wheatstone Corporation, and I'm here to talk to you about our latest innovations in streaming. And that's the Stream Blade and our Wheatstream appliance that we've made to make your streaming interface with your listeners and CDN a lot better. Um, we started about two years ago knowing that there was better algorithms and there's better ways to do streaming. We didn't want to repurpose existing stuff that we've used in other areas of the broadcast industry. And what we really needed to do is we needed to start understanding what the destination was. And ultimately we found out it was a combination of the metadata, the information that your automation system spits out that we're going to be putting on the dashboards or on our smart devices or on our computer screens and the processed audio. So what we set out to do was understand from the CDN side what they were looking for. Um, they were looking for great audio, they were looking for a nice user interface to, in, to interface with the third-party automation systems, the Zettas, the uh, RCS, Next Gen, wide orbits of the world. And that's the information that was really important that that get to the CDN in a timely manner with the processed audio. So we saw an area in the industry that, that needed some help, and so that's what our whole driving force behind Streamblade and Wheatstream has been, is to deliver this, a pain-free, easy, off-the-shelf application for existing Wheatstone users 
or somebody that's got a complete different AOIP system or a traditional analog system and they, they want to get into streaming and they want to get away from PCs. And that I guess was a, a third point is that all of our products run in Linux which means no Windows updates overnight, no Windows sound card changing inputs or outputs or sample rates. So these were designed to be appliances. And I'm going to start with the stream blade because that was natural for us. It expanded on our Wheatnet IP ecosystem. And this to everybody else is a, just another blade that plugs into the system. It's got some analog inputs and outputs, silence detection, utility mixers, all the great features you'd find in a blade with this little Linux CPU sidecar and that will plug into your existing network to get out to the CDNs into the external world. Um, we also have another appliance now which is not a blade but just simply a, um, a 1RU device that's a Linux CPU that houses all of the processing and all the encoding that we offer in Streamblade. Um, these might be for a customer that's already got a complete Wheatstone system and you don't need any of the I.O. You don't need to get to the outside world, just you want to do some streaming. So both products have up to eight individual process streams. Each of those streams can have one of one or up to four outputs per stream. So really you can have a total of 32 output streams. And we say that it accepts native 8 Wheatnet IP or any analog or digital input, um, as well as any drivers that you may be using. Um, we are able to have cloud ready compatible standard CDN and streaming platforms like HLS, Icecast, RTMP, and RTP streamings. So both appliances are very, very flexible and will integrate into anybody's existing system, a Wheatnet IP system, or traditional analog inputs and outputs. Um, the Luthuf transformation filters adapt metadata from any input of any automation systems that require an output, output or format transition to the CDN. So we'll take care of you on that. Um, on the front end, um, we've got a couple codecs. We've got AAC, we've got Opus, and we've got MP3 encoders depending on what you're trying to send. And in a moment, Jeff Keith's going to tell us about the processing and why the processing for the stream blade and why the processing for the wheat stream are so different than anything that, that has been offered before in the industry. So we look forward to sharing that information with you. Hi, Jeff Keith for Wheatstone. I'm here to talk to you about our processing in the stream blade product. It's something I've been working on for a little bit, and uh, it, so far it's been uh, it's been well received by uh, the beta testers in the field. It's a uh, it's a basically it's a it's a derivative of what we would use on air, with the exception of the back end. Obviously, with Codex, the back end's got to be a lot different. There's no clipping, no preemphasis, uh, nothing nasty going on back there. It's very Codex friendly. The uh, overall signal flow it basically comes in from either analog AES three or Wheatnet IP or AES67 input, comes into a six band EQ. That goes into a five band Linkwitz Riley crossover for very, very good phase uh, behavior. There are five band processors. Those uh, then feed a mixer to allow you to set whatever tonal texture you'd like. The output of that then goes into a bass management and uh, stereo width management block. And the purpose of those is to basically be able to replicate the kind of on-air bass that, uh, that a lot of markets uh, are driven to. And from the codec standpoint, if you're running very low bit rates, we want to make sure that the uh, stereo width isn't too wide. That can kind of uh, tease codecs and, and do nasty things. And then there's a, a peak energy management and a final peak management block that makes sure that the absolute peak level never exceeds whatever you set it to. And the output then goes to the stream encoders or to or and to a monitor output which can be analog Wheatnet or AES67. The um, EQ is a six band uh, design. It's basically a high pass filter uh, to roll off any uh, low frequency stuff that might be uh, nasty. And then there's four parametric sections. Those are uh, basically able to be adjusted in gain bandwidth and frequency for booster cut. There's a low pass filter at the output to roll off any unwanted high frequency stuff. Uh, very low bitrate codecs. They might want to set the low pass filter as low as like 12 kilohertz. UQ then feeds the multiband section. This is different from any multiband section you might be familiar with. 
Uh, there's a lot of magic going on here. It's a derivative of something I was working on, uh, experimenting with uh, some neural network uh, behavior. Uh, but basically, it's looking at all of the dynamics, uh, short, long-term dynamics of the incoming material, as well as what it's generating on its own. And uh, the three, three controls allow you to basically tailor how that behaves with, uh, with your program content. This particular structure is not uh, dependent upon any interband coupling. The bands kind of know what the other ones are doing anyway without any coupling. The uh, output then goes to a mixer. And the mixer again allows you to set whatever tonal balance you want out of the uh, out of the processing. And then the final limiting is is kind of interesting. It's a this too is a derivative of of what we would do in a in an FM on air uh, processor. There's a bass management section in there which allows you to uh, tailor the bass feel uh, and and lower registers as as you might want for your on air signal. Uh, obviously, you'd like your stream to be something like your on-air signal without actually doing on-air processing. And then the, uh, there's a peak energy estimator, which kind of, de kind of determines how often certain kinds of peaks are happening. And it communicates with the final peak management to make sure that the peak level is, is always no more than what you've sent it, uh, set it for the with the output control. And that section talks back to uh, the peak energy estimator to make sure that peak limiting is never excessive. Uh, it, it's, you know, if you set it for, you know, like 3 dB on peaks, you're going to rarely ever see it do more than that. Oh, so this is, uh, this is it. This is uh, the way the stream blade works and um, hope you like it. Thanks.